Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I think that the attendee number has started to slow down. Um, I'll give it just a few seconds. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I think that the attendee number has started to slow down. Um, I'll give it just a few seconds. Okay. Uh, Thanks again, everybody, for joining Chandra Data Science. I think this is going to be a very interesting and exciting uh, science workshop, not that our past ones haven't been exciting or interesting. Um, <clears throat> we're going to start today with a little bit of a welcome and then go on to some meeting logistics. And so to start give that welcome. I'd like to welcome uh, Pat Slane, the director of the Chandra X-ray Center, who is going to share a few words. Okay, thanks, Rudy. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome all of you to the workshop. I wish we were all meeting um, here in Boston in person, uh, and so uh, that we could see each other better face to face. But um, um, we do have a, a really great uh, extended program here for this, so uh, we'll have to do with the virtual approach to, uh, to now. Um, <clears throat> the topic of um, novel methods in computing and statistics for X-ray astronomy is, is a pretty broad one, which I can see from looking at the, uh, the agenda of talks, uh, and it really illustrates a lot of the approaches that have been used to tease out some of the really the most important and impressive details that uh, that Chandra is able to to probe. Um, from, from my own perspectives, I, I've seen uh, plenty of these types of approaches uh, taken as some data uh, um, um, observations uh, of supernova remnants and pulsar wind nebulae, which is sort of my area of um, most fascination, I guess. Um, I can recall early on uh, um, studies by, uh, led by Jack Hughes and his, um, his student Jessica Warren, where, she, where they approached uh, or they, <clears throat> they applied a, a principal component analysis to studies of um, Tycho supernova remnant. And you know, I'm, at some point or another, we've all um, learned about uh, applying uh, basis vector techniques to to characterize complex spaces. This was um, a novel approach to me at the time of actually using the spectrum of the supernova remnant to derive these components and then to look at their spatial distributions. But the, the, the result of it was an ability to identify where the forward shock of the supernova remnant was sweeping up um, circumstellar material, where the reverse shock had progressed through the ejecta material and where the contact discontinuity was separating those two fluids. It was really a, a, a you know, a, a, a very nice and important result out of some sort of novel techniques of the time. And in other supernova remnant work, um, my colleague Laura Lopez and, uh, and, and others have um, pioneered um, another approach of moment analysis to the brightness distributions of supernova remnants. You'll hear more about that this week from uh, Tyler Holland Ashford, and um, it's uh, uh, it's a, it's also a very interesting sort of approach of the type that we're talking about more broadly at the workshop. Um, as important as, as those things are, um, there have also been other techniques that um, or tools, I maybe should say, that have been brought to the to the uh, forefront. And within my own area of research, this includes suddenly making uh, studies of non-equilibrium ionization plasmas. Um, um, uh, available to, to everyone, uh, including uh, the effects of uh, recombining plasmas. And, and this, this corresponds to new development of models and implementation of them in, in XPEC and Sherpa and the like. And we'll hear more about that during the workshop, but it's, it's hard to underestimate how important that has been to the contributions of Chandra. So um, I, I think um, we all look forward to hearing about more of these uh, techniques in all the different research areas. And uh, I just appreciate everyone for um, contributing to the workshop uh, and to this approach to uh, science. And I hope you all um, enjoy the workshop along with me. Thank you very much for that, Pat. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Moritz Guntner and myself, who are the co-chairs of the meeting, and we're going to tell you a little bit about the logistics of how we're going to run the meeting. Um, we're using 
the Zoom platform and we're using the webinar mode, which means unfortunately that we everyone can't see all 114 of you that are in the participants channel now. Uh, but I, I want to also point out that we did send a link to you all to join the Slack channel that we set up for this workshop. Uh, in that Slack channel, we will be extending the discussions beyond whatever cannot be gotten to in the sessions that we are holding. In particular, if you have a question and you're in the Zoom session, you're welcome to put the question in the Q&A. Uh, you can also put the question in the Slack channel and we will monitor that for questions as well. Um, <clears throat> I will copy any questions that we haven't gotten to or copy all the questions into the Slack channel uh, so that you all can see those after the Zoom session has ended. Another logistical thing that I would like to uh, point out uh, is the science organizing committee that helped us put together this program. They're listed here uh, from all over the planet, and we are very grateful for the effort that they put in selecting our invited speakers and helping us design the program of the, of the workshop. We also had a special session subcommittee uh, of these four individuals here and they help plan the special sessions, which are these two coffee chats that we're having, one on Thursday ahead of the science sessions at 11. Uh, it's a coffee chat with uh, folks from the AAS journals who are gonna tell us this, about some of the aspects of software and data science applications and concerns that you might have when you're writing, publishing uh, journal articles. And we also have a coffee session on Tuesday, August 24th, with former X-ray astronomers who have gone to data science positions, and they're going to tell us about their career paths and trajectories and what it's like and how well their uh, X-ray astronomy prepared them for their new positions. We also queried you all for self-organized tutorials, and I'm showing you the results of those now. Uh, we're going to have this self-organized tutorials on the various aspects that we're talking about uh, at this meeting. We're going to have an introductory Bayesian X-ray analysis section on August 30th, that's Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, and then we're going to have a more advanced one on Tuesday the 31st. And then on September 1st, we're going to have 3ML, a 3ML tutorial. Uh, these are, we'll share the Zoom information for those later with you all, and you're all welcome to attend these and participate with the instructors. We're, after each of those three, we're going to have a Chandra X-ray Center-led one, one on DS9, and a lot of the advanced capabilities that DS9 has been adding to the, its uh, system. And we're going to have one on the 31st on using the Chandra Source catalog to do uh, science. And we're going to have a Sherpa tutorial as well on September 1st. So I hope you can stick around for those at the end of the science sessions in the next two weeks. Uh, our invited speakers this week are listed here in their respective sessions. Uh, next week, we'll have even more invited speakers and we'll have a panel, which is section session 10. And this panel is going to be all about large catalogs, cross-matching, and uh, really fun big science that you can do with in X-ray astronomy. <clears throat> so with that, I think I'd like to start our first session. And so I would have our first speaker, uh, Johannes Buchner, share their slides now if they can. Johannes Buchner is coming to us from the MPE and will speak to us about Bayesian X-ray spectral analysis. This is the BXA. Uh, that I mentioned in the self-organized tutorials. Um, yep, let me share my slides. Looks good. All right, let's see if I can bring up my self here. Okay. Um, good day. My name is Johannes Buchner. I will be talking about Bayesian X-ray spectral analysis, uh, in particular the BXA package. 
And uh, I would just, because it's the first talk, I thought I'd just give a bit of motivation why we do X-rays in the first place. Uh, X-rays are messengers from the hot and energetic universe. So we have here on the right, for example, um, galaxy clusters where the hot gas is emitting and um, it's, it's uh, only visible in the X-rays in the mission. And on the left, we have compact objects like uh, supermassive black holes, which we cannot reproduce in the laboratory. And they are very interesting systems to study. And X-rays allows us to do that. Um, just in general, the science questions we typically have, here I divided them in two categories. Um, for example, you might be interested in some parameter of interest, for example, luminosity, column density, temperature, some parameter of a model. And you want to say, make a statement that with high probability, the true value out there in the universe lies between A and B. Or you might want to say, oh, it cannot be above B, otherwise the data would be very different. And the second type of science question we have is we want to distinguish uh, different uh, processes um, or, for example, Compton upscattering versus branch Stahlung or something like that. Or we want to test for additional absorption emission or cutoff features, something like that. Um, so that would be comparing models. And another aspect of this is checking whether one particular model uh, can actually explain the data. Uh, here, I just want to give a bit of a brief story of how we tell ourselves the observations are done. And I'll talk in particular about X-ray spectra from a point source, but uh, many of these concepts can be transferred to other data, like timing and, uh, and imaging. So on the left, you have your astrophysical source with, with its source spectrum. The X-ray photons enter the uh, mirror modules of the telescope uh, twice reflected and focused on the detector, where they are transformed into an electron cloud, um, where uh, and and count become counts in energy channels. And we can model this whole procedure by projecting through a response matrix. One is an, an example shown on the top right here. Um, and you see it's not a diagonal matrix, so we cannot invert this process to infer the source spectrum. We have to forward fold and um, to, to estimate the counts expected on the detector. So uh, if we do this linear approximation, uh, basically you assume some source spectrum, you assume you know your instrument, you, you additionally have some background emission coming in, and you can simulate uh, what you would expect, how many counts you would get, and then you can make a Poisson uh, realization of that to compare to your actual data. Just to remind you about uh, count data, uh, here is the Poisson distribution formula and plotted on the right. Um, the counts are integers uh, and, and they cannot be negative. So, uh, and you see from the distribution that it's not a symmetric distribution. So if you use Gaussians, um, they will lead to biases uh, uh, in, in the low count regime for sure. Uh, I remind you also that if you take this Poisson likelihood that I just showed you and you apply this trick of taking the logarithm and multiplying by minus two, you get um, this, this formula here, which is known as CSTAT or cache statistics, uh, depending on, on what constants you drop. Uh, if you do the same with the Gaussian uh, likelihood, you get what's called chi-square. Uh, this doesn't mean anything except saying, oh, we assume a Poisson uh, data process or a Gaussian data process. If you have multiple bins, you project this through. Uh, as I said, your flux uh, spectrum, you project it through your response and you get the number of counts you expect in each energy channel. You, you sum up your statistic and um, that gives you your likelihood. So we've, we've, we've established this forward folding that gives you the probability to produce some data, assuming all of this process, uh, assuming a source spectrum, instrument model, and so forth. Um, and that we will casually call the like likelihood. But what we actually want is the probability distribution of the source spectrum parameters. So we want the probability distribution over the parameter space, not over the data space. And we want to identify those regions in those parameters which have high probability. And nobody knows how to do this from scratch, but we know the next best thing, which is Bayesian inference. 
Uh, and I'm sure you, many of you have, or most of you have heard about it. Uh, I'll just keep it brief. Basically, the idea is to start with the probability distribution called the prior um, prior distribution. So that's already a probability distribution over the parameters. And you update it with the likelihood function, which is not a probability distribution over the parameters. You update it, and on the left, you get the posterior distribution. And uh, you see here on the bottom left an example of such a probability distribution. And you look at where most of the probability is, and that uh, allows you to answer some interesting science questions. Uh, the term on the bottom right in this equation is um, called the evidence. It normalizes the posterior. It's sort of the average likelihood over the parameter space. Um, and it can be used for model comparison that I will get to later. So you can do this. You can um, make grids in your parameters and you can do uh, Bayesian inference and everything is great. Except uh, in real life, it's a little bit more complicated. So parameter spaces like the ones shown here on the left uh, can have these weird banana shapes where they have multiple peaks. They can have odd tails, and that's important if you want to put 99% uh, uh, limits on something. And they can be high dimensional, by which I mean you have 5, 10, 20 parameters uh, that you want to constrain. And at the same time, we're getting into an era where we have many sources, a large number of sources from surveys, from the X-ray archives. And even if you don't have many sources that you want to analyze, you might have one particular source, but many models that you want to contrast. Uh, and if you want to do this in reproducible science, you want, you want to use some robust algorithm that deals with these complications uh, that I mentioned. Uh, so some global algorithm that, that allows you to automate this process. And here I'll be talking about nested sampling, which, which does address these, these problems. And uh, if you're familiar with Markov chain Monte Carlo MCMC, uh, it basically jumps around in this parameter space and the visits uh, sort of give you the, uh, the, prob the probability distribution. So you basically build a histogram with these vertical slices, but nested sampling works sort of the other way around. It makes horizontal slices. Um, so you try um, in each iteration to build one of these Lebesgue slices and uh, compute the height of the slice, which is the likelihood and the width or the volume of this accessible parameter space um, uh, at the same time. And the, the integration over these slices uh, is then the integral, the, the evidence, and the importance of each shell gives you the posterior probability distributions. So how does the algorithm work? Uh, basically, imagine your parameter space is two-dimensional, like shown here on the left, you throw in 200 points, and you find the one that gives you the worst fit, and you take that one out, and you have to imagine the volume represented by these points now shrank by a factor of one over 200. And now um, you put another point in, drawn again uniformly according to the prior distribution, uh, but with the constraints that the fit has to be better than the one you just took out. So, and if it doesn't, you, you repeat the process. And if you do this iteratively, Every, in every iteration, the volume shrinks by a constant factor, one over 200. So you are, we are keeping track of the volume that is accessible and you have access to the likelihood, the height of each of, each of these slices uh, by the likelihood that you just removed. And if, as you iterate and iterate, you always take out the worst fit. And so in, you end up in a situation where uh, all the points are concentrated at the best fit or near the best fit in a very tiny read, uh, volume, and then you can stop because you inter uh, that tiny volume doesn't contribute to your integration anymore. Now, the missing piece here is how to draw this unif uniformly distributed random point, uh, but with this likelihood threshold. And uh, just like in MCMC, you have to put in some transition kernel in nested sampling, you have to put in that, uh, that process for this likelihood restricted prior sampling. But the nice thing is about nested assembly is that uh, there are general solutions here. Um, basically, there are two big classes, uh, some random walk algorithms, and the class that I will talk about are um, those that uh, use the existing points to find the neighborhood region 
and only sample, sample from that neighborhood region. And uh, quite famous is Faultiness, which clusters the existing points with, an, an, uh, with a clustering algorithm into ellipsoids um, and uses some uh, bit more ad hoc criteria to split these clusters. Um, and um, I will mostly be talking about ML friends, which is another algorithm which doesn't use uh, this kind of ad hoc clustering but uh, builds ellipsoids around each point and then cross validates leaving some points out to make sure that the region built is robust and you have some safety guarantees. And so this is a bit more uh, well-motivated, less ad hoc algorithm to use as nested sampling. And it's, and, but both of these algorithms work really well in practice and um, give usable results um, with realistic models. There's a review and there's some animation that you can check out how the algorithm process progresses. Um, but let me just come to BXA. So what is BXA? Well, it connects one of these uh, inference engines that is very robust based on nested sampling with a fully fledged fitting environment, which has community developed legacy models and, and new models that come in. Um, and the established data formats, um, and you, for example, Sherpa and PyExpec can be connected with BXA to Multinest or Ultranest in the latest versions. And that's just a hundred lines of code in essence. Of course, now it does a little bit more um, like background models and visualization tools, but the point is what is really enabled by this. And what is enabled is that you can do very sophisticated analyses and get very interesting results on the probability distributions. And I'll show you some examples. So basically, you can fit any model and data supported by whatever fitting environment you use, as long as you define your priors and you get posterior probabilities and the evidence for model comparison. You don't need to define a starting point. You don't need minimal number of counts. And don't, you don't need to rebin your data for that. I'll just show an example here for the. Uh, for the low data count uh, case. So here I'm uh, simulating uh, Chandra spectrum of a heavily obscured AGN. So it's a, a absorbed power law, and some additional uh, content scattering in green, and an additional soft component in purple. And what I'll do is I keep this uh, the spectrum, spectral shape the same that I used to generate, but I'll make it fainter and fainter. And on the right, you will see uh, the parameter constraints on the obscuration and luminosity. So initially, all of that probability uh, in the posterior samples is very well concentrated, but as you become fainter and fainter, lower and lower counts, this uh, expands, and at some point you even have two modes, two solutions here. But even if you have zero counts, uh, you still learn something, namely at the bottom right quarter of this um, plot is always excluded because otherwise, in the bottom right, you would have a luminous, unobscured, or less obscured AGN, and that you can exclude already with your low count data. So there's no limit here. Um, BXA also includes empirical background models for a wide, wide variety of uh, missions uh, shown here that we developed in Simmons et al. Uh, using a machine learning method. We basically uh, did a PCA analysis on um, archival data, and it's quite neat to use these because you get more uh, signal to noise or you get more signal out because you, you put in more information about what your background is supposed to be. And one e example application here is X-ray redshifts. We, uh, in, the, in the deepest Chandra observations in the Chandra deep field south, it's quite difficult to find the redshifts of active galactic nuclei. Um, because the exposures are so faint, there are so many possible counterparts in these, uh, in these deep surveys that you could assign uh, that source to. Uh, and furthermore, it's difficult, even if you find the right counterpart, it's difficult to get uh, uh, optical spectroscopy to measure the redshift. So it would be neat to get those out of the X-rays directly. And what you'll see, what you see here um, in this plot is the source spectrum you see a bit of a clump here, which actually corresponds to the iron K line um, at a redshift of 0 0.7. And on the, on the right, you see a less obscured 
case of another compton thick AGN like on the left, uh, a less obscured case. And you see some wiggles here, but it's very difficult to tell by eye what is instrumental wiggles and what is um, what is absorption edges that you could also use for redshift. But if you put all of this into BXA and use a sensible X-ray obscure model, you get the posterior distributions here on the left. And indeed, you can constrain the uh, redshifts to the true spectroscopic values. And uh, here in the Bayesian inference, I, I didn't have to do anything specific about uh, each instrument, whereas in the classical analysis, you would have to tune thresholds for each uh, particular instrument you analyze. Uh, once you have these posterior distributions, uh, you might want to go further to sample distributions. For example, here on the left, you have some uh, parameter and uh, at each epoch of your object or for many objects, you have these probability distributions and you want to infer what is the intrinsic uh, distribution uh, incorporating all these uh, uncertainties. And there is a very neat uh, technique to do that. I think there's a lightning talk on that um, called uh, hierarchical Bayesian models. And uh, the neat thing about it is it, it adding additional uh, less constrained objects doesn't wash out your signal and it incorporates all that uncertainty. And we have a, um, an implementation called posterior stacker that, that does this and produces uh, plots like on the bottom right here, you get the intrinsic or the, the sample distribution out um, uh, and it can ingest outputs from BXA or whatever analysis you've, you, MCMC or whatever analysis you've done before. And here is show some examples. On the top left, you have gamma ray burst uh, obscuration uh, distribution, so column density um, fitted with a couple of sample distributions like the Gaussian. Um, if you just look at the mean of this Gaussian, um, you could also divide these kind of samples up and look how the mean behaves in these different subsamples. And this is what Baroncelli et al. Uh, did on the top right here for the reflection. Um, in sort of intensity uh, for the narrow in blue and uh, in red for the broad relativistic lines. And uh, uh, what uh, Baroncelli found here is that for both, there, there seems to be an effect with luminosity. Um, on the bottom right is an, a, a similar analysis for the obscuration fraction as a, as a function of orientation of the uh, AGM. So very interesting uh, analysis you can do here. I want to also highlight Eurozita, where recently we've released the EFETS field with 22,000 AGN in there, uh, which we've analyzed with eight models. So you can imagine the computational complexity and you really need a good inference uh, machine that can, do, can deal with this. Um, so we have the X-ray spectra in blue here, get probability distribution for each model. And then you want to do sample distributions like shown here on the bottom right, you get the column density distribution of that particular sample and the photonics distribution on the top right. Now I want to talk a bit about model comparison. Uh, for model comparison, uh, it's always important to keep in mind what question you're asking. So if you have, for example, just empirical models that try to approximate the shape uh, of, or and the effective behavior of your data, then you might want to uh, just look for the model that uh, has enough um, capability to store the information contained in your data. So you want to do something information theory based, or you might want to pick a model based on how well it extrapolates to data it hasn't seen. That's very common in machine learning, so the prediction quality. But if you have models that, are, um, that, that dif differ in physical scenarios, um, often in these cases, you have uh, well justified priors for all of your parameters, and uh, you can do Bayesian model comparison with the evidence and base factors. And that's what we did in 2014. On the bottom right, I show different obscure geometries that are plausible, and we were able to uh, distinguish between these uh, uh, different physical scenarios using uh, model comparison. And just to illustrate how that works, um, let's say you have one model um, that is relatively inflexible, like illustrated in the middle uh, here, and two can just make some uh, more or less line shapes. 
and it sort of fits your data reasonably well, um, but in, in some region of its parameter space. But if you include also another model, which is much more flexible, like the one here on the left, so you can make all kinds of uh, twisted shapes, then you will, of course, find a better fit, uh, higher likelihood. But it will be in a very small volume of this parameter space, because as soon as you move away, the model has to do something very different, because it's very flexible, it will make a different shape. And so the multiplication of likelihood and volume will be uh, lower because the volume is so small. And uh, in other words, this prediction diversity, this unused uh, prediction capability is being punished uh, by this averaged likelihood, marginal likelihood. And so you can do this uh, integral ratios, uh, Z1 over Z2 here it is the base factor. If you multiply that by a model, prior odds ratio, you get a posterior odds ratio, which, which tells you the probability of model one compared to probability of model two. Um, the, uh, the drawbacks here are that you need these model priors, um, either you, you have a good idea for them. Um, and the second issue is just because one model has a higher uh, evidence value, that doesn't, and you, you decide to say, okay, this is my true model, I'm gonna pick that one. It doesn't tell you the rate, the, the rate at which you would make a false decision. Three so, minutes. Uh, what I would, yep. So what I would recommend is uh, to always make uh, simulations. Uh, so you generate a bunch of data on the one model and under the other model, and you, you, you try out how often you would make a false decision. So that allows you to get um, uh, base factor thresholds and the, the nice thing about this is then you have the best of both worlds. Um, so basically, so here's an example from, uh, from, from one paper where we also showed that this works better than likelihood ratios. The advantages here is you, you get rid of the parameter prior dependencies. You have these frequentist properties on some Bayesian methods, so you, you know how often you would be wrong, uh, but you still retain this inter interpretability of the base factors and, and uh, the, the, the consistent Bayesian application. The disadvantage is it's computationally expensive, um, but with nested sampling is actually feasible. I think I said that. Um, so yeah, there are a couple of styles to do model comparison. Um, if you just want to test a model in isolation, you probably want to do posterior predictive checks or uh, parameter bootstrap. If you have competing models, it depends whether as I said, whether they're empirical um, or whether they are more physically motivated. If they are nested, if you have additive components, maybe you just want to estimate the strength of that additional component and you can just do parameter estimation um, or you can do a Bayesian model comparison. So just so I will just finish with some practical advice. You can do a good Bayesian inference with any package. Some make it easier than others. Um, it's important to state what you're doing. Um, I would recommend to always use Poisson statistics because the reasons to use uh, Gaussian statistics are basically lie in the numerics and in the optimizers, and we have better tools now, so no reason to use those. Um, not everything has to be a test, so visualizations are important. Vary your assumptions and priors, do a lot of simulations. And there are some uh, groups uh, available to ask for help and you can open issues on GitHub. And on that point, BXA is a software package that is open source developed. It allows robust inference within environments that you're already familiar with. Um, it's community developed. Please contribute, report bugs. It's currently lacking a bit on the visual, visualizations end. So if you, if you want to contribute there, that would be an awesome way to start. Uh, we have some tools uh, that are sort of turnkey for fitting AGM. Uh, heavily obscured AGM or mildly obscured AGM. And you, you could have developed your own tool for your own uh, science case and process the, the archives. And uh, we'll have a tutorial on BXA in August, uh, as, as was said, with uh, end of August uh, with Peter Borman. Um, yeah, there's some additional resources uh, of previous workshops, and there's uh, awesome uh, X ray primer on uh, the CXC website. 
So thanks for that. And uh, let's stop here and uh, take your questions. Thank you, Hannes, for that very thorough and uh, very interesting presentation about uh, Bayesian X-ray analysis. I'm, I'm especially am looking forward to the, the tutorials uh, at the end of the month. <clears throat> if you have any questions for Johannes, please add them to the Q&A or put them in our Slack channel. Uh, if we don't have any questions right away, I can ask some, but... Uh, we have a question from Keith Arnott, who's asking, uh, mentioning that you didn't say anything about the choice of priors. Do you, do you want to speak about the choice of priors? Um, I'm not sure what exactly the question is, but um, yes, you do have to choose priors and it's good practice to vary the priors and see how sensitive the result is. Um, there are some uh, well-defined ways to choose priors. Uh, for example, you want to minimize um, the, the information you put in, you want to maximize your ignorance, for example, that's, that's one way to define priors. Uh, you might have uh, prior knowledge from previous observations, previous uh, sample studies might give you distributions that you want to work with. Uh, so for example, for AGN, we have the photon index and we quite know quite well from the local universe the photon index distribution, and so we could apply that to a higher redshift universe. Another application of priors that I've used is um, we might have probability distributions from photo Z codes, right, um, on the redshift. And now with BXA, you can actually ingest those probability distributions into your X ray analysis. May, uh, instead of just assuming one point, now you marginalize over all of these possibilities, which have, might have multiple solutions. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, overall, the choice of priors depends on your application, and you have to choose something sensible, and and ideally vary those those assumptions. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Hermath, who is asking: uh, Is Bayesian X-ray analysis only suitable for cache statistics, i.e., dim sources, if they assume correctly? Um, as in bright sources, the counts go to the Gaussian regime. Uh, yes, you can. You can use. Uh, I mean, if you if you know what you're doing, uh, you can you can use Gaussian statistics. If every channel that you work with uh, has high counts, sure, no problem. You can still use the Bayesian X-ray analysis. Is is your answer there for for the those that are in the Gaussian uh, limit? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Other questions? We have about one minute more for questions. Uh, if we're not getting from the audience, I will ask you one myself, Johannes. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you're doing a model comparison, what what is the, the measure or the metric that you get to, to tell one or the other? Is it the probability that the model is correct or? Um, yeah, so, um, so what you have here on the left is the probability of model one being the true model compared to model two being the true model uh, given the data you have in hand. Um, but that only gives you a relative weighting. It doesn't make a decision for you. Um, and if you want to make a decision, so Bayesian inference is just for weighing probabilities, but if you want to make a decision and you want to say, oh, I have um, uh, with some thresholds on this uh, quantity, um, I will make a mistake only in 1% of the cases, then you have to do simulations to find those thresholds. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you again for your excellent talk. Um, I'd like for our next speakers to start sharing their slides while I introduce them.
Our next speaker is Becky Nevin. Becky is joining us from the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian, and will speak to us about harnessing machine learning to improve the background rejection of Chandra HRC. Yes. Okay, I'm unmuted. Hold you on. Are. I, of course, this isn't working after we just used it. Classic. Okay. Um, here we go. Looks good. That's way better. Okay, thank you. Um, I also shared my slides as a PDF in the general Slack channel if anybody needs to open them, if you need to zoom in or anything like that, or look at them later. Okay, cool. Um, I'm good to get going? Yes, go ahead. Great, thank you. Okay, so the goal of this project that I wanted to talk about today is to really explore, can we use machine learning techniques to improve on the background rejection of Chandra's high resolution camera, HRC? And so I'm going to be specifically talking about HRC, but I do want to note that overall, I think this problem is pretty broad in scope. So I think this has applications in other particle detectors beyond just HRC, but I will be specifically focusing on HRC today and HRCI very specifically. Um, I also wanted to say that the way I talk about the background is in order to reject it, but I do wanna note that I think another goal of this project is to understand more about some of these high energy particles that we might wanna reject from X-ray images, things like cosmic rays. I think we can learn physical things about cosmic rays using projects like this, because after all, people might spend their entire careers studying cosmic rays, for example. Okay, um, my final caveat is that we have just begun this project, myself and this team of people, and so what I'm really looking for with this talk is feedback from the community. I'm gonna lay forth for you what the motivation is for this project and what we've preliminarily done, but I do wanna hear from people if you have suggestions or questions about this project. And I will give you my email at the end of this talk. Okay. So I'm calling this project Eve after my favorite movie, Wally. -E. She's the robot from Wally. -E. And I'm calling it Eve because this is an event screening tool for Chandra HRC using robots, AKA machine learning. And in Wally, -E, she's a robot that is really effective. I'm saying she, but I guess it's they are a robot that is really effective at analyzing the situation at hand and doing what they're designed to do. And so that's what we'd like to do with this project. We'd like to create a tool that can scan through X-ray events and understand things about those events in order to say, is this event a background event or is it definitely a real X-ray event? And so that might look something like this. I'm going to describe the axes of these plot, this plot in a minute, but for now, just know that these two axes are parameters that you get from X-ray events. And what we'd like to do is use the plethora of information that we get from each individual X-ray event to assign each event a probability of being definitely background or definitely x-ray, depending on whichever way you wanna think about it. So in this plot, the different colors would give you that probability. And then our eventual goal is to define a threshold and be able to say, okay, this is definitely an x-ray. We are not gonna filter it out. We are gonna filter out all background events um, below a certain threshold. Okay, so I'd like to give you the use case the goal for this type of project is really to increase the signal to noise in HRC. You can also think about this like reducing the background. And I think there are a couple of different domains for this type of goal. So first of all, by, reduce, by increasing the signal to noise of an observation, you can detect more extended low surface brightness features. So I'm showing you an example of this for Cassiopeia A. And I think this also really applies to the outskirts of galaxy clusters that have extended very faint features. Another type of example of the use case of this type of project is being able to detect very compact but very faint sources. So you can already start to see that there's different types of things we would want to do that are sort of different depending on the spatial extent of emissions. So that's important to just keep in the back of your mind for later. I also want to note that 
due to condensation on the UV optical blocking filter of ACES, ACES's sensitivity to low energy x-rays is actually decreasing over time, but the same thing doesn't affect HRC. So this really motivates us to go forward with this project now at this point in time. Okay, here's a crash course for everybody on how HRC works, just getting into this conference right off the bat. So HRC is not a CCD, it is a microchannel plate, which means that its fundamental unit of detection is X-ray events. So what I'm showing you on the left here is an image of Cassiopeia A, which you're gonna see a lot, made up of 6.9 million X-ray events. So what you're seeing is actually a 2D binned histogram of the X and Y position of all of these individual events. So an X-ray event happens when a particle or an X-ray enters the detector and you have a microchannel plate here which produces a cascade of electrons. And so an event is when there's a charge cloud of electrons that encounters this wire grid. So I'm showing you a side view this is actually a two-dimensional wire grid. You can think about it like this. Um, one, one direction is the U direction, one direction is the V direction, if that comes up. And how HRC reads off information about X-ray events is there are these readout amplifier taps, which are placed every eighth wire along each dimension. And so the essential unit that it's reading out is the charge buildup on these individual taps for each, each individual X-ray event. So you might imagine you get a lot of information from each X-ray, which is why X-rays are the best rays in the case of HRC. Specifically, I love that you get all this information. And oh, ignore what I'm highlighting here for a minute. I just want to show that for each individual event that's come through this microchannel plate, you get information like time, position, things that are related to the charge um, at that location. And then these um, quantities that I'm highlighting are FB and FP. These quantities are related to the distribution of the charge cloud. And so let me go into more detail about this. The spatial distribution is interesting because when you have an event that comes through, um, the amplifier that has the maximal charge, B in this case, um, will be the center of the charge cloud. And then you can define these different quantities, which are very useful for this project. First, I'm going to tell you about normalized amplitude, F sub B. This is the charge at B divided by the total charge at the two neighboring amplifiers. In a similar way, you can define the fine position, F sub P, which tells you a little bit about the distribution of the charge cloud because it's giving you the charge at C over here minus the charge at A. Okay, so when you put these two quantities together into this two-dimensional space, you get a hyperbola shape, which I think about this way. So based on the path of the X-ray event, or whatever is causing the X-ray event through Chandra, you can basically say things about that path given its location on this plot. So the locus, um, or loci, however you want to think about it, I think that's how you say that, of um, the hyperbola is this region that's like densely populated with X-ray events. That area is most closely associated to real X-rays has been found in the past. Whereas if you have something like a cosmic ray, spoiler alert, that's a source of background, that might fall more off axis in this plot. Okay, I'm gonna talk more about this in a minute. So unfortunately or fortunately, depending on who you are, cosmic rays also enter the detector. It's not just real X-rays. And so that's the source of this project. So, um, the sources of high energy particles other than cosmic rays include solar energetic particles and even secondary particles that cosmic rays might trigger within the detector. But for now, I'm just going to talk about galactic cosmic rays because they're the primary source of background. Okay, so when Chandra launched, it turns out that its orbit takes it through the radiation belt. So it ends up above and through the, these radiation belts, which protect from galactic cosmic rays, which means that the cosmic ray contribution to Chandra was much larger than expected. It's about 250 counts per second. 
Um, for now, I would just think galactic cosmic rays are protons, electrons, or ions with energies in the range of tens of mega electron volts to giga electron volts. So the impact as cosmic rays enter HRC looks like this. They come basically all the way through the detector the majority of times. Um, Chandra HRCI has anti-coincident shielding, which reduces the non-X-ray background contribution from these cosmic rays by a factor of five. So that takes you from 250 counts per second to 50 counts per second. And basically what's happening is this anti-coincident shielding is triggering when it sees a cosmic ray that makes it through the detector, which eliminates all events that happen at, a, at the same time, point in time um, in the detector itself. Okay, but this still leaves you with 50 uh, cosmic rays counts per second. And so that is significant. And that's the whole goal of reducing the background beyond just this hardware measure. So Stephen Murray in 2000 defined a zone of acceptance in this tap space that I previously defined for you. Now it's just flipped over. And he's using the same um, types of requirements I just talked about. Basically, he found that the majority of X-ray events fall within this narrow band. And if you're outside this narrow band, you're most likely to be a cosmic ray. So he's defining this area of acceptance. This is called the hyperbola rejection technique. And it does a pretty good job, I would say. It reduces the background by a factor of two. So on the left is an unfiltered HRC image of Centaurus A, the AGN jet. And on the right, the hyperbola correction has been applied. And you can see visually by eye that it does get rid of some of the source events, about 5%, but it by far does a, it does a bigger decrease of the background events in this image. Beyond that, Grant Tremblay has been working on Hyperscreen, which is an algorithm that's very similar, but that's able to build upon the Stephen Murray algorithm to further reduce the background. So now we have a 20% lower background which is big depending on your science goals. And I think the cool thing about hyperscreen is that it's a dynamic acceptance zone. So it's drawing these lines around the hyperbola shape, but it's doing it on a tap by tap basis. So you can start to imagine that it's fairly important where you are um, in this charge grid. And this introduce, introduces an element of nonlinearity, showing us that various different parameters in the events are important to determining if they're real. Okay, so the, the big question for this project is, can we do better? We think yes. And we think yes, because we have so many parameters to work with. And in the past, we've only been focusing mainly on these FP, FB parameters. These are those hyperbola axes for the U and the V direction. But we've seen with some preliminary analysis that various other parameters like the pulse height amplitude, and the sum amps are important also for separating background from x-ray detections. Okay, and that's where Eve comes in. So I wanted to get into what we've been doing with this project very briefly and give you some of the main takeaway messages. So I think the main takeaway that we've learned is that the data set we're using really matters um, because it determines what type of tool we assign for the project. So I think the first thing about the data set is that we don't have simulations of cosmic rays coming through the Chandra optical path, which is fine. We have a huge archival database of HRC observations over many, many years. And so that's what we've been using as our training set for this project. Then to get a little bit more nuanced, it really matters what you use as background examples and as real or foreground or I sometimes call them source examples. So those two things really matter. What also matters is your degree of certainty <laughs> if something is a background event or a foreground event. And so there are a couple of different options if we want to adjust our degree of certainty. So supervised learning is when you know for sure, you're saying we know for sure which is a background event and which is a foreground event in our training set. Semi-supervised has proved to be a little bit more flexible because we can relax one of those um, we know for sure sides of that assumption. So I'm going to give you a brief example of both of these approaches. 
So for the supervised approach, we've been using a random forest, which is an ensemble of decision trees. So any individual decision tree basically takes this huge data, data table, excuse me, I almost said, or data frame, depending if you're thinking in a Python mindset, data frame of information and determines which are the most useful parameters in this data frame to separate and classify at each junction. Um, so random force is able to combine many different individual decision trees, which is useful because it gets a better idea of overall what are the most useful predictors. Um, I like random forests because they are not a black box. Instead, what you're able to do with them is look at which are the most informative predictors and really break down physically what that might mean for your problem. Okay, so we train a supervised random forest using what I'm calling image cutouts. So for example, here's an HRC eye observation of the Lachman hole, which is a region of low column in the galaxy. And it, you can see, or maybe you can't see, this is very faint. There are still X-ray sources in this image. So what I'm doing is actually cutting them out using source extractor and then saying, okay, these orange dots are our regions of source and everything else is the background. And we're saying we know both of those for sure. And here I'm showing you the distribution of these same events in the hyperbola space. So, oh, thank you. So feeding this into the algorithm, we train the algorithm and then we apply it to Cassiopeia A, which I would say yields fine results, like they're okay. Um, so here is an example of x-ray events we classify as definitely background. Um, first problem, Cassiopeia A clearly appears in this example. So that's something we've been thinking about. Um, but something good about this is that very faintly around the outside, um, the events around the outside of this image are more likely to be classified as background. You can also see this when you look at the events that are classified as source from this example. It really leaves out the outside. So I think the main takeaways from this type of analysis is that we've been thinking about how to balance the relative examples. That's important for a random forest. We've also been thinking about what we use as the training set. We used very compact sources and we don't want this algorithm to be over specialized. We want it to be able to work for extended sources like Cassiopeia A. So unfortunately, I don't have a final conclusion for this method, just that we're in the process of working on this. Um, so for the semi-supervised learning approach, we have been using something called a positive unlabeled bagging classifier, which I've really enjoyed. Basically what you're doing is giving it stowed background, which is when the telescope is not operating, is not open for HRC. So you know for sure these are your positive, these are for sure background events. And then we've been feeding it a very bright science image from which it uses a bagging process to iteratively sample. And that's how you build this classifier. When we apply this classifier to the same example, Cassiopeia A, it does a similar thing where it is somewhat positionally important where the event, events are, and it's more likely to accept events in the center around ne the nebula as real X-ray events, which is positive. Um, I would also draw your attention to the fact that when we look in the hyperbola space, black means definitely an X-ray. We are picking up on this like area of the hyperbola that Stephen Murray and Grant Tremblay had previously noted are definitely X-rays um, within this independent method. So I think that's a cool result. Okay, I'm gonna quickly conclude here. So I'd say the lessons learned so far are that cosmic rays are a significant contribution to Chandra HRC, and that over time, um, we do need to address these and find different ways to think about them. Our overall goal is to increase the background sensitivity and background rejection. And the point of this is to really look at some low surface brightness features, as well as very faint compact sources and imaging. And then I talked briefly about how the design of the training set is actually very important to the approach that we end up using for this project. And I talked about two such approaches we've been pursuing. And then finally, I will just leave my email here in case anybody has any thoughts 
or suggestions for this project or training set. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Becky. That was very interesting. I'm very excited to try to use this for uh, future HRC observations or, or archival ones for that matter. Yeah. Uh, we only have a, a short time for questions. I will point out that um, use Slack if you can to post your questions, and especially for this case where it might be a long detailed discussion. Uh, Moritz has added a question to the top discussion channel specifically about your um, work here, Becky, that maybe you can add to later. I'll ask this question from Rafael uh, Martinez Galarza, who says, uh, you see, they see you use this method to mostly reject non x ray background events such as cosmic rays. Can you also use it to separate source photons from a background source photons, um, i.e. photons that might have similar properties and might share the same spatial location as the source, but that are not associated with it? That is a very interesting question. We've also been thinking about the difference between non-X-ray and X-ray background. And for now, we're really focusing on the non-X-ray background because my suspicion is that it'll, it will be easier to separate in this parameter space. I kind of think this, is a, this should be an ongoing project, maybe beyond my time, if I'm gonna be short-term working on this project, because I do think separating the X-ray background is an entirely separate but related thing that is very interesting and also I think has been worked on a great deal. I haven't looked into it a ton, um, but is of great like physical interest to a lot of people. Awesome. Sorry, that was a non-answer because I haven't <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done that, but I suspect it is related but different. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, will our next speaker start sharing their slides? Becky, feel free to join the Slack if you haven't, and uh, if you want to address some of the extra questions in there, go ahead. Yeah, I can definitely do that. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Peter Cosette from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, who's going to speak to us about a systematic search for ionized plasma signatures in the X-ray spectra of accreting systems. Take it away, Peter. Hi. Thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me to talk here today. I'll be talking about a systematic approach to searching for ionized plasma in accreting systems. I will specifically focus on, on my field of study, which is accretion disk winds in various accreting systems. But as you will surely understand, the applications of this technique are much, in principle, much broader. Let me just first very briefly introduce accretion disk winds. As we know, accretion onto compact objects in, involves material in falling onto the compact object. But since this phenomenon is very extreme, can be very extreme, there are also phenomena in the disk, in the accretion disk, which can instead create an outflow of a fraction of matter, possibly into infinity. Such winds have been observationally discovered in many different types of accreting systems. Actually, I would say that they have been discovered in most types of accreting systems that include X-ray binaries, active galactic nuclei, and ultraluminous X-ray sources, in my talk, I will mostly focus on this last type on ULXs. And the most important property of this outflow, of this disk wind, is, is its velocity. It strongly depends on where it originates from, since the escape velocity at each radius is related to the circular velocity in this disk. So therefore, if we have a, an outflow from the inner accretion flow, the velocity of this outflow can easily reach high fractions of the speed of the light between 0.1 to 0.3 speed of the light. And therefore it has extreme kinetic power and can it affect, it can potentially affect the accretor surroundings very greatly. For example, we think that these winds could contribute or, or even drive AGN feedback in galaxies. And then in a smaller, on a smaller scale, we observe huge ionized bubbles of plasma around these ultra luminous X-ray sources, which could also be driven by, by powerful winds. I said there are some mechanisms that can drive these outflows from the accretion disk. I will just go through one of these in, in more detail. As we know, the material infalls through the accretion disk of, of a compact object, and it loses some fraction of its potential energy through radiation. Therefore, the emitted radiation exerts radiation pressure, which counteracts against the gravity on the infalling material. Then we have the Eddington limit, 
limit which defines the max maximum mass accretion rate or maximum accretion luminosity at which this radiation pressure balances out the inward gravitational force on the material assuming spherical symmetry. So since in, in practice, accretion disks are not spherically symmetric, we can exceed this Eddington limit. This is how it could work in, this is how it could work. Uh, we have an accretion disk, which at large radii from the compact object is not dominated by radiation field and therefore it is geometrically thin, optically thin, chakra sunyev standard, standard disk. However, as the material approaches the compact object, the radiation pressure starts increasing and it puffs up the accretion disk. Uh, and, and at the same time, it launches powerful winds of, of matter away from the disk in, into infinity. This below, I'm showing how a numerical simulation of this process looks like from Takeuchi 2013. And you can see this very massive uh, and geometrically thick accretion disk, as well as a very messy outflow of matter, which is clumpy and has a high velocity. So, so of course, since these, the radiation pressure is likely the highest in the inner accretion flow, these outflows are very powerful, very fast and energetic. Now, there are other possible wind driving mechanisms, but I'm, going to, I'm not going to spend too much time on these. I will just say that instead of radiation on, on electrons and protons, there can be radiation pressure on specific line transitions in the UV, or there can be magnetic acceleration of material along due to magnetic fields, as well as Compton heating, which is basically evaporation of, of the outer part of the accretion disk due to the hard X-ray radiation from the inner accretion flow. Now, if we do have an outflow that is being accelerated from the disk, the material is being lifted up, and then it is ionized by the extreme radiation from the inner accretion flow. Therefore, the material emits and absorbs at various elemental transitions, which can be determined from laboratory measurements. And many of these transitions actually lie in the X-ray energy range, which is why the X-ray band is so useful in studying ionized plasmas. Now, if the material is out of our line of sight towards the X-ray source, it will produce emission lines. Then the resulting emission line spectrum that we could observe is the sum of the emission from all of the material out of our line of sight. So it can be very difficult to model in some cases because we need to know the geometry and the properties of material at all, at all solid angles from, from the accreting object. However, if the material is along our line of sight, it absorbs some of the X-ray radiation from the X-ray source, as I'm showing here on the top right schematic. And therefore we are sampling the properties of the material exactly here in the point where the material is crossing our line of sight towards the source. This is why the absorption spectra are particularly useful because we're sampling the properties of this wind right here in this one point. Now, since the material is moving relative to us, the elemental lines are going to be Doppler shifted and therefore their energies are going to be either blue shifted or most likely blue shifted relative to us. And then we can determine the, the relative velocity of the material towards us. The most important properties that we can determine from this absorption, from this ionized absorption modeling is the, ioniz the ionization state of the material, which is determined from the ion ionization grids basically from the relative ratios of the different lines. Here are some examples of what an ionization spectrum might look like for some ionization xi. Then we also can determine the column density, which determines how, how much material there is between us and the source, basically determines the depth of the absorption features. Then the systematic velocity, which is determined from the Doppler shift of the features, as well as turbulent velocity from the, the width of the individual features. To, to understand and to study these objects and outflows, we of course need suitable X-ray instruments, which can both resolve these individual features. So we need good spectral resolution. And we also need good collecting area to get a good statistics for our observations. I will just mention XMM and Chandra, which currently offer the best capabilities for, for studies of ionized plasmas and they carry both CCD-based and grating-based instruments. In general, CCDs offer reasonable spectral resolution in the harder X-ray band, but quite insufficient resolution 
at below two kilo electron volts, where many of the extra transitions are located. On the other hand, the gratings offer excellent spectral resolution across the band, but they offer much poorer collecting areas. So either we need to observe for much longer, or we need to observe brighter objects. The, the two grating instruments are RGS on board XMM Newton and AGTG on board Chandra. Of course, we're looking forward to calorimeters, which will come in, the, in a couple of years on, on board Grism, which will offer both a good collecting area and a very and an excellent resolution in excellent spectral resolution across the whole band, basically. Now, let's say we already have a next ray spectrum and we suspect that there is some ionized emission or ionized absorption in the spectrum. Now, how do we determine what are its properties? or how do we determine what is the statistical significance of this detection? If the X-ray spectrum is of very high quality and we can identify the individual features, then we directly apply the photoionization spectral model and infer the physical properties of this plasma. However, the problem is that many X-ray line spectra are not actually of very high quality. And especially if we are expecting large Doppler shifts of 0.1 speed of the light or more, these features can be difficult to identify. So the question is, what is a significant plasma detection? And what is the correct spectral solution? What are the correct plasma properties? Now, let's just look at this simple spectrum on the right, where we have a, this is the RGS grating spectrum from XMM Newton. And I'm showing here at 0.8 kilo electron volt a possible absorption feature. So now the, now the question is, what is the probability that this feature is an actual fe absorption feature from a highly ionized plasma? Or, or what is the probability that, is, that this, is, this feature is not just due to pure Poisson noise? Of course, we use, the, use fit statistics to, come, to calculate this probability. We calculate the statistics of the model that doesn't include the line versus a model that does include the line. So the blue versus the red model. And this defi this, this way, we will get some delta chi squared or delta c stat, depending on which statistics we use. And that determines the strength of this feature. But, but especially, it only assumes a single trial performed. But in practice, if we do not know where to expect an absorption feature, or if to expect an absorption feature at all, we perform many trials. Either implicitly, we look at the spectral residuals and we note, notice, we note some interesting residuals that could look real, or explicitly we add a Gaussian or some model to the data and then fit for some interesting properties. So in principle, we search quite a large parameter space to achieve some, some good fit. And, and since we search such a large parameter space, this increases the probability that the space will contain a strong feature that is, however, only due to Poisson noise. And, and therefore, it, it could be interpreted as a real feature, but it would be completely fake. This is called the look elsewhere effect. And it has to be co corrected for if we want to, unless we want to get many false positives. So, to solve these issues with lower quality spectra or with spectra which, where the lines are not easy to identify, we can perform systematic searches. We can, a simpler way to, to search this spectrum is to just scan it with a Gaussian line. So we basically take the residual spectrum and then we try to put a Gaussian line at all possible line energies or wavelengths for all possible line widths and then calculate the fit improvement for any of these possibilities. This is what is shown on, on, the, on the search on the bottom in this figure. We basically put a Gaussian line at all the possible wavelengths then fit and recover the fit improvement. The fit improvement is always positive, but I'm just showing here multiplied by the normalization of the line to, to show apart absorption line, possible absorption lines from possible emission lines. So this locates some possible strong residuals at their best fitting wavelength. And now to correct for the look elsewhere effect, we have to run the same search on simulated data sets of this object containing just noise. So we simulate the, the data set, which has the same exposure, the same Broadman model plus Poisson noise. And then we run the same search again and again. And, and then the fraction of 
simulated spectra that have stronger features than the one that we are seeing in the in the real data set gives our gives, gives our false positive chance now a more complex version of this automated search is to use full fully physical ionization grids so we can take a photo ionization or a collisionally ionization collisional ionization grid generate a full range of of possible parameters like for example ionization parameters possible systematic velocities possible velocity width which is the same as the turbulent velocity and then we apply we again fit all these different possibilities to the data and recover the fit improvement here this is i'm showing a systematic search for a very fast outflow in an active galactic nucleus and we can see that a very strong fit improvement has been reached for for a very specific velocity which is approximately 0.1 speed of the light and for quite well defined ionization parameter of log xi of approximately four now in principle we could use some more complex mcmc methods to locate the peaks but what i have found is that this parameter space the fit improvement parameter space can be very spiky very localized in some cases and so it would be very easy to miss the best solution and again to correct for the local square effect we have we have to run the same search on simulated data sets again and again and again to determine the statistical significance of any detection like like this one for example this is of course a big issue because it it can be very computationally expensive in, in principle a proper rigorous search including the monte carlo simulations can be of, of the order of 10,000 cpu hours for one object so it is definitely usable if we are studying a small number of objects but it is quite difficult to use if if we want to study a large sample of objects now in the second part of my talk i would like to go over some applications of this search i will specifically focus on ultra luminous x-ray sources ulxs are defined as any non-nuclear point x-ray source with an isotropic x-ray luminosity ex exceeding the eddington luminosity of a standard star mass black hole that is 10 to 39 arcs per second. So these objects are not active galactic nuclei. They are not supermassive black holes. They're often found in star forming regions and galaxies and in low abundance regions. Here on the left plot, I'm showing one example, which is the Cartwheel merger. We, on the left is the HST image in optical and UV. And then in the middle is the X-ray image with Chandra, which is showing many ultra luminous X-ray sources in the, in the sites of local star formation many times we also see these ultra, ultra luminous x-ray sources located in these massive bubbles hundreds of parsecs large of ionized plasma which indicate that their luminosity is true and not beamed just towards us so the long-standing question has been what are these objects are they more massive black holes accreting at sub eddington rates or are they super eddington accretors nowadays we know that at least the majority of them are in fact super eddington accretors Many or maybe most of them are actually neutron stars. So since their accretion flow is supercritical, dominated by radiation pressure, it's a good question to ask if we can detect any fast radiation-driven winds in, in their spectra. And in fact, in some of these objects with the best quality data sets, such winds have been found. ULXs are quite luminous, but since they're located in external galaxies, their fluxes are very low. So only in, in the best quality, in, in a few objects with the best quality data sets, we have been able to achieve the, these kind of detections. Here is the best example from NGC 1313X1. So Pinto et al. detected these highly blue shifted absorption features in the, in, in the spectrum of, of NGC 1313X1 with a velocity of 0.1 to 0.2 speed of the light. At the same time, so these come from, from a very fast, powerful wind that is being blown from the accretion disk. At the same time, they, de they detected these um, narrow emission features, which seem to be low velocity or almost rest frame, so come from, from some stationary plasma. So to, to detect these features and resolve them, the absorption from the emission, we, need, we really need high resolution X-ray instruments like gratings. But now what about the other ULXs? These, these have much poorer X-ray spectra in general. So 
in, in this spectra, it will be much more difficult to identify the individual line features. So we use the, the systematic search to try to detect any, any signatures of ionized plasma in their spectra. Here is one, one example, which is NGC 300 ULX1. This is a nearby ULX with a good quality XMM Newton and star observations, in which we took all of these observations and then we then we performed the same systematic search as, as I've described in the first part of my talk. We, we scanned a large number a large parameter space of ionization parameters and then a large space of outflow velocities then fitted this to the best fitting broadband spectrum and we covered the fit improvements and we find a very localized best fitting solution for with a velocity of about 0.22 speed of the light with an ionization parameter of 3.9. Now again we run the Monte Carlo simulations to estimate the significance of this detection which is 3.7 sigma so we cannot say that this is a confirmed detection of an outflow in this object, but it is very strong evidence for, for this outflow. Interestingly, the, we can infer the kinetic power from this, from the properties of this outflow, which is 10 to 40 ergs per second, which is comparable with the X-ray luminosity of this object and more than sufficient to inflate the ionized bubbles located in, around many of these ULXs. And now let's just look at the spec, spectra directly fitted with this best fitting model. And what we can see is that the features are really very weak. We can see the a blue shifted oxygen aid absorption line at 0.8 kilo, kilo electron volts, and then an iron 2526 complex in all this XMM and new star data sets between eight and nine keV. So what I'm trying to say here that these features are very weak and it will be very difficult to spot by, by eye. And this is why the systematic search is so useful. It can locate the best fitting solution, and then it can also tell you exactly what is the statistical significance of this detection, or basically what is the chance that these, these residuals are due to pure noise. Another excellent example is the recent discovery of a spectacular outflow in NGC 247 ULX1. This object is a spectrally very soft ULX, which shows simultaneously strong emission and absorption lines in the spectrum, and none of them are completely restrained. So Pinto et al. Uh, carried out a large XMM Newton campaign on this object, and then they searched systematically both for photoionized emission and photoionized absorption simultaneously. So here in the left, so they're scanning for both ionization parameter of emission and absorption, as well as their velocities in, 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 a, in a broad parameter space. And, and they, they found that the best fitting photoionized emission Photoionized emission is, a, is redshifted with a velocity of approximately 0.04 speed of the light. And the photoionized absorption is blue shifted with a velocity of approximately 0.17 speed of the light. And what I'm trying to show here is that this parameter space of fit improvements is, is, very, diff, is, is very complex. And then and if you, this search was performed by hand, it would be very easy to miss the best best fitting solution. Three minutes. Showing again the thank you, the the power of the systematic approach. Now, in in the last part of my talk, I will talk about our most recent project, which is a systematic search for ionized emission and absorption in the population of ultraluminous X-ray sources. Our initial studies of of a broader population of ULXs showed that shown that we find Emission, emission lines from oxygen at low velocities in, in multiple sources, not just the ones in, with the best quality data sets. So we decided to collect all of the good quality ULX data sets and search them for any narrow spectrum lines, both in absorption and in emission. We, in, in the final sample, we collected 17 ULXs and two super Eddington pulsars to create a sample on super Eddington accretion in stellar mass objects, almost 100 observations and then search them all for narrow spectral lines. As I said, this is a very costly project using the traditional fitting method. So we developed a completely new search method, which is similar to the direct fitting, including the Monte Carlo simulations. But instead of fitting, we're calculating cross correlations between the spectral models and, and the data. Applying this cross correlation search to all of the observations, we detected the we selected the strongest line detections and created the first catalog of spectral lines in 
soft X-ray spectra of ULXS with more than 100 line detections. And here is the histogram of the detected features separating the emission lines from the absorption features. What we find is that the emission lines seem to be strongly concentrated around the rest frame transitions of magnesium, neon, iron, oxygen, and nitrogen. So this is, again, the same picture as we have seen in the best quality ULX data set, is that we have this low velocity but quite highly ionized plasma, which produces these emission, emission lines. On the other hand, the absorption features seem to be avoiding the rest frame transitions of these, of these elements. This is best seen in oxygen and this iron transition. So they likely come from highly blue shifted absorption, which is fully consistent with blue shifted absorption from fast winds with velocities between 0.1 and 0.2 speed of the light. And therefore it appears that this absorption that these fast disk winds are a common feature of ULXs in general, and not, the, not only in the few examples that, that we, where we have been able to detect them strongly in individual spectra. So just to summarize very briefly, if an X-ray con spectrum contains spectral lines which are not straightforward to identify, so it has unknown plasma parameters, it has unknown Doppler shifts, we can use a systematic plasma search to locate the correct solution but it is always crucial to rigorously determine the significance of any detections using these Monte Carlo simulations. Otherwise, we end up with many false positives with detections that appear significant, but actually are due to pure noise. We can, there are different types of searches that we can apply. A simple one is just to scan the spectrum with Gaussian lines, but there is also a more complex version, which, is, which applies more complex plasma emission or absorption models. The disadvantage of these models is, of these searches, is the high computational cost. However, we are currently working on much faster methods which are improving the performance by a factor of more than 10,000. These have great applications to detect and, and determine the properties of fast outflows in ultra luminous X-ray sources, in active galactic nuclei, but also beyond this field, for example, in the determination of properties of galaxy cluster line emission, or for example, in detection of the warm hot IgM absorbers. And thank you, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Peter, for that excellent presentation. It's like you're finding needles in the haystack. I really enjoyed it. If you have any questions for Peter, please put them in the Q&A and also use the Slack, especially if you want to carry on that conversation with uh, Peter. I'm going to check over on the talk discussion channel now for questions for Peter. If we have no questions from the audience, I will ask a couple of questions that I had for you, Peter. Um, I learned this new term, look elsewhere effect from your talk. <laughs> and it's exactly, I, I immediately understood what it meant. And I'm curious, have you ever looked elsewhere and you land, if you land on a line, what, what happens in that trial? So are, are you talking about if, if I'm applying this systematic search or if I'm just randomly looking for lines in a spectrum? Randomly, like ran, randomly looking for lines to measure the significance of one that you have. I see. So yeah. So when, when we're just looking at the spectrum, it is important to determine what, what are acceptable parameters Sorry. for any of these lines, and then to perform a completely blind search across all of these parameters on, on simulated spectra. Okay. Which, and it's going to significantly reduce the significance of any, any of the lines in the real data. With, with high resolution X-ray data sets, it can easily I think reduce the significance of any detection by a factor of 1,000. Wow. Okay, we have a question from Dan Wilkins who asks you if the wind emission features you find are around the rest frame transitions, but the absorption features are blue shifted, is that consistent with a spherically expanding wind like a P Cygni profile, or are they different components? So here, I would say that I think we currently only have one good example of slightly redshifted emission features, which would be exactly 
the same as yeah p signe profile blue shifted absorption and red shifted emission but i don't think we have good enough population information about these these lines to make that conclusion right now one might think another approach to that if you are looking at a system do you ever if you're comparing stars within a system see the absorption features or it's not stars, but uh, ULX, potential ULXs or other sources. Do you see the same features in absorption, but then different, different uh, shifts, velocity shifts? You mean in different objects? Right, different objects in a system that's um, maybe in the same IGM. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, what, what it seems is that these emission features are very low velocity, so uh, they, they always land close to the rest frame. And, and okay. it seems that the absorption features have a range of velocities, which, which can vary in time as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if it was exactly this p signe profile, but I think at this time we, don't, we cannot make that conclusion yet. Awesome. Okay, that's all the time we have for our first section. I will point out there's a question for you from Hui Yang uh, in the Slack channel. If you can join Peter and go and answer that, that'd be great. Okay, thanks. I welcome you all to join us for the 2 p.m. session where we will have the following um, slide, following presentations. starting at 2 p.m. Uh, today in Eastern time or in about 30 minutes. Uh, so I hope to see you then. Thanks again for joining us. And uh, this channel will stay open. No, actually, this channel will close in a few moments. I'm going to leave this slide up for a little bit. But it's the same Zoom link to join back for the afternoon session.